Volcanoes are one of nature's most destructive powers. They've molded and sculpted the planet, but at their most violent, have also wiped out whole cities and been responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths. Yet since the dawn of civilization, people have settled on the flanks of the volcano, attracted by some of the Earth's most fertile soil. Because of the threat posed by these volcanic eruptions, scientists around the world are looking at ways to protect these vulnerable communities. Cambridge volcanologist Clive Oppenheimer specialises in developing new equipment to help predict more accurately when and where an eruption might happen. His work takes him around the world, but today he's come to Sicily. I've come to see Mount Etna, one of the most active volcanoes in the world. It has eruptions a lot of the time, and it's a great place for me to come out and try new techniques for monitoring volcanoes. It's a flying visit, and Clive is hoping the weather will be good enough to head up the volcano. One of the things that uh, makes volcanoes difficult to study is, of course, a lot of the action goes on under the ground and we can't see it directly, so we have to use all kinds of different techniques to measure what's going on. He'll be meeting up with his research students, Letizia Spampanato and Giuseppe Salerno. Giuseppe uses remote sensors to measure the gas emitted by the volcano, and Letizia uses thermal imaging cameras to study lava flows. Both of these give vital clues about the volcano's activity. With the team together again, they set off on their journey towards Mount Etna. Mount Etna is one of the oldest active volcanoes and was formed around 250,000 years ago by activity deep below ground. Subsequent volcanic activity is constantly altering the landscape of the volcano. The devastation caused by these previous eruptions can be seen everywhere and acts as a constant reminder to the local community of the danger of living here. Look at this. When did this happen? Uh, in 1983. Now, do you think we should ring the doorbell first in case <laughs> anyone's home? Or... <laughs> yeah. It's just destroyed. This is the top floor. This isn't even the ground floor. Yes, it is. Crumbs, look at that. As volcanologists, we're sort of interested in how the Earth works and what's inside a volcano. But when you see this, you realise that it's also about yeah, protecting just, people from the hazard. It's not just science. There is a real impact, a real world for the people that are living here. Lava flows are particularly dangerous because you can't always see them coming. The lava can form tunnels known as lava tubes, which hides the path of the lava down the volcano. Well, hey, it's a lava tube. As the lava flows, the outer layer begins to cool and crust over, forming a roof over the lava below. Well, this is a fantastic secret that you've revealed to us, Giuseppe, a beautiful lava tube, and the lava has run down through here and through the, the tunnel in the distance. The lava must have been very high up, up at the ceiling at one point, but then, as the eruption finished, it drained down and down and down. We're now walking here on... This would have been the last bit of lava that flowed out of this tunnel. I mean, we're lucky we can be in here now. It's, it's an ancient, frozen lava yeah. tube, but it also reminds us a very important part of your work and your monitoring of the volcano, yeah. that you, you try to detect these tubes because of the, the hazard that they present. Letizia's work with thermal imaging cameras helps find these hidden flows which, undetected, could wreak havoc on the towns below. Civil protection authorities will also use this information during eruptions to construct barriers from old lava, which can divert the flow of fresh lava away from the towns. It is something that's actually a bit controversial, because you might have a lava flow coming towards your town and put all these barriers up, and well, it just sends it off to somebody else's town. And it has happened, I think, 100 years ago, there was a, an eruption and there was a fight between these rival villages because they were all trying to divert the lava flow away from their, their village. Having seen an old lava tunnel, the group need to push on if they are to strike it lucky and find a fresh lava flow further up the mountain. The vegetation is starting to disappear because we're really getting high up and it's colder. All these lavas are recent in the last 20, 30 years. 
The team have now come as far as they can by car and will have to trek round the volcano on foot. Satellite images from the observatory have helped them locate where the lava flows are, but getting to them is a different story. They're nearly 3,000 metres up and at this altitude the conditions are tough and unpredictable. The first priority is to find a safe passage round the volcano. As you can see the conditions are not good. Lots of uh, clouds, fog and also mixed with the volcanic gas are coming in these directions. However, Giuseppe and Clive went to explore if there is a good path, in, just in the case the condition would be better. There's maybe one possibility would be uh, just to make it easier, there are some patches of snow and might be easier to walk on that than to walk on the lava, but I'm just still not sure about the weather. As Clive heads off to look for another path, the winds change, clearing the way for a possible route round the volcano. The group push on, trekking over the solidified lava underfoot. There are two main kinds of lava and have been given the Hawaiian names Aa and Pahoehoe. Aa is a rough, block-like lava and Pahoehoe is a much smoother, coiled structure. We've made fantastic progress crossing this horrendous lava and there's gas pouring out of it. That's the gas that Giuseppe measures. I can even hear it hissing in the distance. We need to find where the active lava is and active lava doesn't really look much different from the ancient lava that we're walking on. So Letizia right now has the thermal infrared camera and she's looking, scanning around, trying to find the heat source so we can find that active lava. <laughs> The combination of Letizia's camera work and the stench of the sulphur vents indicates they're getting close to the lava flow. Can you hear that? It sounds like a jet plane taking off. That must be where the vent is for the, the lava that's pouring for, from the ground, coming from deep, deep down. This is fantastic that we've managed to get this far. And I think we can probably make it to the vent itself. We made it. Yeah. Magical. Well, we made it. We made it to the lava mouth itself, where brand new lava is being born out of the volcano and erupting and flowing down the side of the mountain. A few hours ago, that lava was kilometers down inside the earth, brewing and rising up, and all the gases coming out of it, forcing it up to the surface and that's pushing it down the hill and it's just a miracle to see this I'm really happy to be here and I'm glad we stuck with that journey across all that horrendous lava with the bad weather it was really worth it to make it here I don't think we should stay too long because I can smell burning rubber and I think it's my boots so it is pretty hot here with the weather turning again it would be crazy to stay around for long there's just enough time for Letizia to take some readings and Giuseppe to collect a sample We took a sample of fresh lava to, to make some analysis, chemical analysis, to understand which kind of magma we are, we are seeing t this afternoon. Clive, do you think that it's enough? I, I think I don't want to see you do that death-defying yes. act again. I think that's, that's perfect. Yeah. Yes, Still it's very really hot. hot. The next day, Clive rejoins the team at the Institute of Volcanology in Catania. Situated over 20 kilometers away from the volcano, the Institute is where information about the volcano is processed and analyzed. Giuseppe's work involves looking at the sulfur gas emissions from the volcano, and he has a number of remote sensors situated around the volcano. These sensors scan the sky and collect an ultraviolet spectrum of light which tells them the concentration of sulfur dioxide in the air. The results are then beamed directly back to the observatory. Clive, who is involved in designing the original gas monitoring equipment, looks at the latest data collected from Giuseppe's network of UV gas sensors. Should we take a look at the, the actual results then of how many 
yeah, tons today of gas. It's really nice out. because ah, we have up to 7,000 tons per day. 7,000 tons of sulfur dioxide gas yeah. per day. That's, that's, a yeah, lot. that's a lot. Levels of gas emissions naturally fluctuate around 4,000 tons per day. However, when an eruption is imminent, levels will shoot up. During 2002, 2003 eruption, we reached 20,000 tons per day. It's quite a lot. Mm -hmm. It's important to understand this fluctuation because it's an indication of the volcano, if it's going to erupt or not. Volcanoes emit lots of gases, but they emit more water, actually, more carbon dioxide than sulfur. But we measure the sulfur because it's easy to measure. It, there's not a lot of sulfur dioxide in the background atmosphere, and it's like a messenger for the processes going on inside the Earth. If we can read those messages and understand and interpret them, then it tells us so much about the behavior of the volcano and what it might do tomorrow or next week, and that's vital information for hazard assessment. Yesterday, Letizia took various readings with her infrared thermal imaging camera. As well as helping them locate the lava flow, the data is analysed to help them understand various properties of the lava, such as its velocity and temperature, which can be over a thousand degrees Celsius. You can see it's moving faster in the middle there. Yeah. You can see these very, very hot parts and some cooler yeah. crust. And what kind of temperatures then? What's the, the maximum? Oh. Around 900 degrees Celsius. Oh, that's beautiful. It's also very interesting how you're working here in the infrared region. Again, our eyes can't see the infrared, yeah. but this sensor picks it up and turns it into a temperature image. And yeah. uh, Giuseppe works in the ultraviolet, also where our eyes can't see. So these techniques reveal something that's hidden to our own eyes, but makes these wonderful measurements. Letizia and Giuseppe's work is crucial in understanding the activity of Etna, but it's only part of the work being carried out. Because the volcano could erupt at any time, monitoring it takes place around the clock. The Institute has a 24-hour operations room, which has live video feeds, infrared cameras, and also seismometers, which measure earthquakes. Volcanoes and earthquakes are strongly related. Movements of magma in volcanoes causes small earthquakes, which they can detect here. Oh, well, something happened. Something yeah. erupting. Uh, no, this is the sound associated with the earthquake uh, located right here. And uh, that just happened just now while just we were now. standing here. There yeah. was an earthquake That's there. That's right. Then it provides epicenter and depth, which is called the hypocenter. And of course, the magnitude. One instantaneous geological event just happened in the Adriatic Sea there. Clyde's trip is coming to an end, but the study of volcanology continues to grow. Scientists from around the world collaborate and new monitoring techniques are developed, ensuring the continuing safety of all those living near one of nature's greatest and most unpredictable forces.